Your mom's so shallow, she probably thinks this quip is about her. You're about as deep as a bowl of soup, and your tongue is about as sharp as a soup spoon. Hey, say what you want about me, but lay off the soup. If you love soup so much, why don't you marry soup? Uh, cause I'm already married to justice. <laughs> Welcome to the Sunday Movie Marathon. <laughs> Hello. Is that from Hello. Xavier, Renegade Angel? <laughs> yeah. I was trolling through the, um... Best of clips on YouTube. If you've not watched that show, you should give it a watch because it is something. I have no clue how to watch it because I remember watching a couple episodes years ago and then I wanted to re watch it and I just don't know where it is. It's hard to get a hold of, honestly. You look at like the DVD, you can only get it on like DVD and it's about I don't know, 20, 30 pounds yeah. on DVD and it only comes with like the first and second season. Which is all that there is, so I guess that's what you'd want, but there's no, like, like it's just, it's just that. That's all you get. Um, I think you have to import it from America as well. Yeah, it's, not, it's definitely not available here in the UK. Um, I just, like, watched it online, honestly. I just pirated it as, as much as I didn't want to, but that's just how I had to do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they're not, like, providing us a way to watch it, you can't really be blamed. No, exactly. Just make these things available. Yeah. Honestly. That's going to be a problem with like my next recommendation, which is not available on like physical copy anywhere, but it's on YouTube. So we've got, we, we, we've got two movies to talk about today because Connor's off in the African Alps delivering babies. Uh, he sends his uh, regards. He uh, should be there by now. But what movies are we talking about? Let's get yeah. to the first one. So the first film... It's my pick today, the film Widows from 2018, directed by Steve McQueen. I am a big fan of Steve McQueen. I'd seen all of all of his other films. This was the one I hadn't watched, so I thought it would be good to pick it. Basically, it's about a group of, um, basically the wives of a group of people who were part of this heist, which went wrong and ended up with everyone dying. So there's all these women who are just left without their husbands now. And... Um, one of them gets confronted by one of the um, people that her husband owes money to. So they have to go on this big heist that their husbands had planned to do to finish off what they had left behind. So yeah, what mm -hmm. did you think of Widows? I thought it was good. Um, yeah, it was good, solid heist movie. Um, maybe not the best I've seen from Steve McQueen. Um, but I mean, it's still, it's still good. Honestly, I don't think the man's like, like he's probably one of the best directors working today. Like he's he's just yeah. making consistently great movies, and this is also really great. Um, but like maybe not as great. I guess I just like my problems with it are mostly like I don't have like little gripes with it. It's more just like a like a tone thing, I guess, or like I don't really connect with like the story that's being told. I don't really care about the heist. I don't really care about like as much as I love the acting. I think the acting's pretty spot on for this i don't really care about the characters because i just don't really like it's not that i don't really like understand what they're doing but it's more like i don't care for like the heist in itself i don't yeah. think it's very interesting i don't know about you yeah this is i i do like this film quite a bit um but out of everything i've seen from steve mcqueen it's definitely my least favorite it's adapted it was originally um a mini series on TV in like the 80s that Steve McQueen saw and he like loved it as a kid and it was like very influential on his filmmaking so he wanted to make a film based on it and I definitely felt throughout that he's definitely like condensed quite a lot down into this two hour film I think the only reason I wasn't super invested is because there wasn't really a lot of time to breathe. There wasn't really a lot of time to develop the characters or the story. There's just so much going on. That I found it to get quite overwhelming. I definitely think in a mini series sort of format, it probably would have worked a lot better because you would have had much more time to spend with everyone and the story and get more emotionally attached to it. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Obviously, he did his like small act series pretty recently. I only saw like one episode of that, but um, you know, if he can work with TV, why not? This is like there's like a lot of high profile actors in this. Like I said, the acting's great. I, I was really surprised to see like 
John Bernthal and then Liam Neeson in this, and then like yeah. in the first five minutes or fifteen minutes, they're just like poof, they die, they're gone. I'm like, I what? what? Yeah. <laughs> Liam Neeson just died. Why was he in this movie? Why was even John? But like Liam Neeson comes back, he's not actually dead, um, which was a big surprise for me. I thought that was really well handled that reveal. But then John Bernthal, he's like this like really big, really big actor, and he's snuffed out in a matter of minutes. I'm like really? <laughs> but yeah. I, I kind of like that. I kind of like when films do that with like like A listers. It's like um like in the movie being John Malkovich, Brad Pitt is in that for like a couple of seconds. I I kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah, I do like when films do like that. Even like um, the original Psycho, like I can't remember the actress's name, but she was like fairly big, so everyone thought that she was the star of that film, and she dies like 20 minutes in. Yeah. It's a great oh, yeah. way to subvert oh, yeah. your expectations. Oh, I completely forgot about that. That's a great film. Yeah. Um, I, like, um, I do like all the acting, like I said, like, um, like Colin Farrell. He's always great in whatever he does. Yeah. But um, his character, I just didn't really care about because I'm just like, oh, he's just running for like office or something, or like I don't even know what like, what he's doing really. He's just like this high profile guy who's like running for mayor or something. I don't even know. But I still like his acting. I just don't really like. That's, that's the yeah. thing. I just don't really care. I just don't really care about what they're doing. <laughs> Yeah, I did kind of feel like his subplot, although I did enjoy watching him, I'm not sure how necessary it was to the overall story. No, he was like the most disconnected character from the rest of what what was going on, I felt. Yeah, but yeah, I do love the cast. There's so many great actors in the film. Um, Obviously, Viola Davis is like pretty much Mm -hmm. the lead in the film. It's apparently her first ever lead role in a major studio film which is pretty crazy considering like how long she's been acting and i think she's yeah. fantastic in this film yeah she's awesome she's badass she's so popular as well i'm surprised this is like the first lead for her but she yeah. does it really well um like maybe more in like like the second half i kind of got into uh the acting in her character a bit more but I really enjoyed her. Yeah, and especially like, um, she starts to piece together the possibility that Liam Neeson's still alive. Like, there's that fantastic scene where she goes to confront someone and, like, her dog's, like, barking at the door and I think she realises something's up. Yeah. He's, like, right on the other side of that door. She just, like, turns and walks away. That was really good. I like that. I like um, Daniel Kaluuya and uh, Brian yeah. Tyree Henry. They have like really great chemistry. I really love them. It's like the uh, the Manning brothers. Um, and as much as I loved like Daniel Kaluuya, he he was like a big part of the movie. He's like kind of the villain in a way. Um, plays it really well. But at the same time, I'm like, well, like what's his character really? Like he's yeah. just like this like guy who's like mean, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, but I, I did still, really I still enjoyed him. In, yeah, I enjoyed watching him. I think he had a great presence on scene. There's like. There's a couple of scenes that I really enjoyed from him. Like, there's the bit where there's like two kids who are rapping in this big hall. They find him and like he gets them to rap for him and then Mm -hmm. gets right up in their face and like as they're rapping and then just suddenly shoots them out of nowhere. Yeah. That bit's really (laughs) funny but super fucked up as well. And there's also that great scene in the bowling alley where he's like trying to get information from this guy and like who's paralyzed and he like shoots him in the leg or something or no he stabs him in the leg as he's like like trying to crawl down this bowling alley that bit's really great as well that was fantastic one of my favorite scenes i think like a lot of my favorite scenes are just with him i just get a lot from his acting i think he's a fantastic actor someone who's like risen to prominence in like the last few years with like a like the the minor roles he did on like Skins, and then like he stars in like a uh, the Black Mirror episode, all the way up to like Get Out, and now he's doing like Black Panther and uh, what the Judas and the Black Messiah movie. He's yeah. really big now. Um, nominated so for an Oscar for, for Judas and the Black Messiah as well. Yeah, he's yeah. a fantastic actor. Um, I do. I think like that that scene where he's like just stabbing the guy in the bowling alley was like, oh god, what the hell. Because he like he can't feel anything below his waist, and I'm like, oh god! Every time he like stabs him in like the back or like the arm, he's just like screaming, and then it's like just this blunt hit to it to his legs. I'm like, this guy is like, maybe this isn't gonna like 
kill him instantly, but Jesus Christ, he's definitely bleeding out. Yeah. And that also, like, when they're at, like, the basketball uh, court inside at the gym, he's just, like, shoots the guy in the head. And, like, the camera was just, like, really close. He's just, like, getting, like, really up in their faces as the camera, like, goes, like, around in, like, a 360 kind of thing. And then he's, like, he shoots the guy and he says to his friend, he's, like, run. And then his friend just runs and he shoots him in the back. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, that scene's so good. There's also a bit where um, he shows up to Veronica's assistant's house and like, like with his crew, and they all basically murder him. And he just sits down and watches TV, and you don't see any of the violence. It's just all off screen. That bit's great because yeah. he doesn't care. He's just this guy. Yeah. He's like a hitman in a way. And I don't really know. I don't really like understand what they're doing like him and um brian is it yeah brian t- that guy <laughs> uh i don't really understand what they were doing they like, had this thing in like a church they were like setting up like i don't know they were running for something or other it's just like when it comes to like the story itself i'm a little less invested whereas yeah. i get more out of like the acting and the uh like the set pieces they blow stuff up in this movie it's freaking awesome like a van blows up and it's crazy um but then like when it comes to just like the story that's trying to be told i'm just like oh, i don't i don't really i don't really care honestly yeah i definitely think there's an interesting story in there but i don't know if it was as told as well as it could have been done yeah i do like the uh the main actors in like the uh the heist group you got like um Viola davis and uh the others, I don't know their names, honestly, um, but they were really good. Uh, like, uh, Alicia, she was like, like her mother's like her pimp. She's like setting her up to yeah. be like an escort. Played by um, Elizabeth DeBecky, or DeBecky, yeah. who's in Tenet. Mm-hmm. Classic role, classic movie. Yeah, yeah, she was really good in this film. Um, there was a bit, I re- the sequence I really loved where... Um, Veronica Viola, Viola Davis' character gives everyone roles to do, like as they're preparing for this heist. So um, she like has to go to a car auction to buy a car, but then it turns out she can't actually drive the car, so it was just pointless. And yeah. she goes to a gun store and like emotionally manipulates this woman to buy a bunch of guns for her. That yeah. stuff is oh, really God, entertaining. Yeah. I love that that interaction with like the woman and her child. At like this gun store, and then like Alicia is asking, "Oh, what's the best gun?" And she's like, "Her daughter's like this little girl." She's like, "Mom, you always said a gun is a girl's best friend." She's like what? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love their dynamic. They have like a really good dynamic. All the acting, their chemistry is really good. Um, yeah, I do like the other characters as well. There's like a part where um, is it Linda? Uh, She's like, goes to like this place. I don't, that's the thing. I, I have all these things like written down, like these notes in my head. And I'm just like, this is a moment, but I don't understand what the moment is in the context of the movie. Cause I don't really like care about the story that's being told. Yeah. Um, but it's like, she goes to like this big building place and she asks who designed like a building or something. And then the woman at the desk says, uh, Oh, I'm not allowed to tell you. I'm not allowed to say, I'm not allowed to tell you these things. It's confidential. And then like, Oh, Linda just speaks Spanish to her, and she's like, oh, now that we both speak Spanish, I can tell you all about it. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? That was, that was like a gripe I had. I was like, what? What is that? And then, like, when, um, was it Linda who goes to, like, that guy's house to get some information, and then he tells her to leave, and she's like, oh, you know what? My husband died. And then he's like, oh, your husband died? My wife just died. And then they, like, make out as they cry. Oh, what that? What? Yeah, that what's seems happening really here? Weird. I don't know if you like like that or like not. I didn't really understand like the intent of it, but it was no, like yeah. I didn't really kind of didn't really like it. No. Yeah. Um, I do like um Brian Terry Henry, who we were talking about earlier. I do like mm-hmm. him in the film, but it's kind of weird. He just like vanishes in the film. Like we yeah. never hear from him or see him again. It's super strange. Like there's there's a great scene where he confronts Veronica in her house, like towards the beginning of the film, and he's like telling her about the money that her husband owed, and he like grabs her dog by the mm-hmm. throat, and like it's 
the scene's really good. It's like super tense and quite menacing. And then after that, you just he just isn't in the film anymore. It's really strange. Yeah, yeah I thought that I was like, and we're gonna get like a like a scene with him in like the epilogue. We were going through all these other characters that we'd uh, been acquainted with. Uh, and like uh, Daniel Kaluuya's character dies in the car crash, which was awesome. And then like. You get all these the wrap up for all these other characters, but then it's like this: the villain is just like, I mean, is he the villain? Like in in the he's like the antagonist, I guess. Um, but it's like, what we're not going to see like anything from him. I don't really, I don't know why. No. And like at the same time, like in this epilogue, yeah, you will kind of want to see what happens to the rest of these characters, but like n- nothing really does. It's just like they go for coffee or something. And then like I don't know if you had like a problem with like the very end of the movie because I kind of did it was like re- this really awkward shot and it was like Viola Davis goes out and she like sees Alistair Bickey after like ignoring her at the in the coffee shop and then like she goes out onto the street and it's just this like the camera's just fixed on Viola Davis and she goes oh Alice h- how you been and then it ends I'm like what yeah and that wasn't this is a Steve McQueen movie I didn't expect like something that like awkward and like ham fisted to take place. It was really strange to see it. Yeah, I didn't have a problem with it, but I get what you mean. Yeah. I like that um Viola Davis's character that like, just constantly is walking around with her dog. Like her Westy yeah. dog. I love that it's, dog. Yeah. It's Thank cute. God it didn't die. Yeah. You that dog also it. um that dog also stars in the film Game Night, which I thought oh, was yeah. really weird. <laughs> I just thought it was like the same breed or something, but I looked it up and it's literally the exact same dog. Wow. Glad it's getting work. Yeah. <laughs> Although both were um, in 2018, so I don't know what it's up to now. Who knows? Who knows? Living the high life, starring in two movies. Yeah. Chowing down on some of that Caesar dog food or something. <laughs> the, the, the good shit. <laughs> as much as I like, like the heist in this movie, I kind of, like a lot of it is just like, that heist is just like 20 minutes in the last part of the movie. And it's yeah. like this whole movie is just basically like an hour and 40 minutes of build up. And honestly, I don't, I don't know that that bothered me because it was all like well handled and it all like looked really good. It all was like really sleek and just like the, I didn't really have a problem with like the pacing at all. It felt quite natural to me. So I didn't really mind that the heist only took place in like, like 20 minutes and like it was kind of, slightly poorly handled with the these uh these women who like have sort of taken up the mantle of their husbands and in this like crime family type of deal but like they they obviously wouldn't be as like highly trained as these people who have been doing it for so many years so i kind of i i I like that that they weren't like super like great at it like alice gets shot by like colin farrell's dad and then he yeah. dies. That was hilarious. Um, so I kind of liked. I kind of liked the end of it. But maybe I feel like if it had been a bit longer, like that whole sequence, it would probably would have gotten more out of it. Yeah, I kind of felt just not just that, but I just felt the film generally fe- felt kind of rushed. Like mm-hmm. I just I felt like there was just too much going on and not enough time for anything really to breathe or be properly developed. That's just my yeah. biggest issue with the film. Like, I don't hate it. I don't, like, particularly dislike any, like, specific thing about it. Apart from that, that's literally just the only really I- issue I have with the film, and it kind of brings it down massively for me. Yeah, I'll agree. I kind of, like, maybe wanted to understand the characters a bit more. As much as I like the, the acting, like I said, I do I do want to understand, like, their motivations behind everything that's going on. And maybe just, like, maybe I don't have a problem with the story that's being told. Just, like make it like better i guess just like neaten it up and tell it in a different kind of way because it did feel quite crammed together i'll agree on that apparently the original cut was like over three hours and they cut it down so i do want to see what that original cut would be like because maybe that would have improved a lot of the issues i have when it comes to everything just being all crammed like it is yeah maybe i kind of i don't feel like that's like an excuse honestly it's like oh it would have been good if they let me make it three hours long like that's the same problem we had with like Zack snyder's justice league and it still sucked <laughs> it's like it's so like maybe just do it better like storyboard it in a yeah. different kind of way just like cut it together differently i don't know 
Did you like how they watched Ice Age? <laughs> yeah, that bit was epic. Made me excited for when we can do an Ice Age marathon in the future. <laughs> yeah, that was. I great. love the um, visuals in the film. There's a lot of like really cool shots. Like I think my favorite mm-hmm. one in the film is there's like a bit where um they're coming back from like a political rally and there's like a camera attached to the front of um Colin Farrell's car and it like slowly pans from left to right and it like just attached it's like stays attached to the car as it drives off and drives from the rally to his house. I thought that bit was really cool. I was thinking the exact same thing. I was like, he's going to mention that that shot, wasn't he? That was great. It's like a good way to um combat like the kind of stereotypical uh, filming you get with characters in cars in movies where it's just like shot reverse shot or it's like a wide shot, just like both of them talking. Yeah. Uh, it makes it a bit more interesting and entertaining to watch. That's like what you get from like a Steve McQueen movie. You get these like entertaining, uh, innovative ways of like doing like the same thing that other movies do, but different and a lot more like it's a lot more sleek, I think. And creative. Yeah, I'd agree. Steve McQueen's a great director. He knows just like how to subvert expectations and do something that's different from what everyone else is doing. That's one of the reasons I like him so much. Yeah, he's a great guy. Great director. Why well, you keep um, recommended movies where just black people get shot by the police or like killed by the police? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is like the second week in a row. I'm like, oh god, can't escape it. Especially like nowadays or like in the last couple of weeks. Jesus Christ! You look for movies for like escapism, and it's like this is just it's so close to home. Yeah, yeah. I did like um. There's that sequence where you find out about um Viola Davis and Liam Neeson's son getting unnecessarily killed by the police that scene was super disturbing yeah it was brutal they shot him like in the car like three times yeah it was just like his phone was going off or something and he was just like trying to reach it or something i can't remember what was happening but he just like put his hand forward and suddenly gets shot for no reason yeah (laughs) maybe in a different world we'd be like oh that's that's not realistic the police would never do that yeah, it's upsetting that <laughs> watching that is like, yeah, that's exactly what they're like. Dear, dear. That's a shame. I think, I, do you like, like the costumes for like the heist? I thought they were really cool. Like these black like masks and yeah, just like the and way it, they all looked. Yeah, and they're all using like um, a toy voice changer or something to make them all sound like yeah. robotic. That was really cool. It was cool. like set up. It was like set up from when the kid used it before. Yeah, I thought that was a really cool like set up payoff sort of thing it was yeah um i honestly don't have mm, i don't really have any other notes for this film like i no, i enjoyed it but there wasn't loads to write about i guess there wasn't like loads i found super noteworthy it was just kind of in the experience nothing really jumped out massively yeah I'm, i'm i'm the same i think i like the movie a lot um but would i watch it again i don't think i would honestly because I think I got about as much out of it as the movie could give me. It's quite simple in its execution. Um, and it's very well made. You can't put that past Steve McQueen. But I kind of wanted just more out of it. I wanted it to be more entertaining. And yeah, it's, it, I didn't get that. I think I'd watch it again. Maybe only because it's like so acclaimed. I'd want to rewatch it and see if there's something that I missed the first time around. Whether it all just clicks together the second time and I realised that I was like being too harsh on it but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It depends. If you want to get something more out of it, I guess um, you, you would, but I don't know. I kind of just took it for what it was. There was no like, I just didn't feel like there was much to read into. Yeah. I think that's fair. Um, should we get into ratings then? Unless you've got anything else? Yeah, no, let's do it. Nice. What should we rate this out of? Tasers. Because they tase that guy. It's funny how they were able to use a taser correctly. <laughs> Won't get into it, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, although I'm not, like, a massive fan of this film, and I do think it's Steve McQueen's weakest film, it just kind of goes to show just how great a director he is, just how consistent he is that even his weakest film is still this well-made and still this good. And I did enjoy it. I'd probably watch it again at some point in the future, and maybe enjoy it more, but for now, this is definitely my least favourite of his films. 
and I'm going to give it seven tasers out of ten. Nice. Yeah. I'm about the same. I liked it a lot. Uh, and I, I, I do like Steve McQueen, but I probably prefer a lot of his other movies uh, over this. I prefer a, prefer a shame or a, like a 12 Years a Slave, even like Hunger, which I never want to watch again. But even that was like... Yeah, that was like super miserable. Yeah. Horrifically miserable. I'll never recommend that on here. I just say, like, <laughs> no, I'm never going to watch it again. Never, ever. But this, this was good. So I'm going to give it uh, seven tasers out of ten as well. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Speaking of nice things, I'm going to talk about a very nice movie. I've got a recommendation. It was suggested by my sister. And I approved it because I love this movie so much. It is a 2017 movie directed by Italian director Luca Guadagnino called Call Me By Your Name. It is about uh this uh like blossoming uh relationship uh friendship romance between two guys who meet in the uh northern somewhere in northern italy in the summer of 1983 uh oliver and elio and they sort of it, it bas- it's basically like this just they hang out and they get to know each other and that's basically what it's about they're like just a lot of like reading and like eating food and uh just swimming but it's uh it's really lovely and nice and it's set uh in on location in a uh, crema in italy or crem cremona i love it what what about you chris yeah this this film is incredible it's like just an absolutely gorgeous beautiful film from beginning to end it's so much of the film is just like hanging out in Italy and there's just this constantly like dreamy adventurous feel throughout because you've got just like just the discovery of being in this beautiful place in the middle of summer obviously you've got Oliver who's not seen Italy before and he's going around seeing all these things for the first time you've also got Elio who is in this incredibly formative part of his life where he's discovering who he is as a person and discovering himself sexually and his sexual orientation and stuff like that and i think all of that stuff just comes together to create this really powerful movie that just like i said it's just very adventurous all throughout very powerful very um very sad as well it's quite a sad movie i mean it's set in like um the 80s and i guess uh back in those days and the, these are two like uh, J- jewish men as well so it's like, yeah, I get a lot from like, maybe like back then it was kind of considered taboo. There's a lot to do with like how they kind of put it off a bit, uh, their feelings towards each other um, for fear of being like looked down on, I guess. But it's like, it's set in this like almost like cut off from reality type of place where it's just set in like this one summer in the north of Italy where like they don't really have to deal with like societal pressure or like uh, norms but they can just be together in this one uh, moment, if you will. And I do like that a lot because it, it makes it feel like really like timeless. It's removed from the modern quotidian. It's, it's just, uh, I think it's, it does help that it's say in the eighties, like before mobile phones and the internet. So you kind of understand like the, the timeless quality of it a bit more. Yeah, definitely. I think um, helping it fit in with the period, they do a great job of, um, making it look visually a lot like that. Like, um, obviously it's all shot on film and it just looks mm. beautiful. And I think just all the framing, colouring, just general setting and um, all the locations, it really looks of its time. Like, there was multiple points watching the film where it doesn't really look like a film released in 2017. It literally does look like a film that could have been made in the 80s, um, maybe by like sort of like an Italian or European director um but he is italian yeah yeah of course um and i think just setting it in the 80s also does a great job of like creating this feeling almost of like nostalgia in like reminds me a bit of like how it and stranger things like they have this feeling of adventure and nostalgia where you can just do anything you want and you're just like limitless and can have fun with your friends and stuff 
it kind of captures that as well, but in a much more like mature way, much more personal way. And I think, yeah, it's the perfect place to set the film. Yeah. I feel like like it and Stranger Things, they're going for nostalgia. They really are. Um, But with this, it's like the nostalgia is like baked into it. It's like you couldn't really set it anywhere other than uh, Italian summer in 1983. Yeah, of course, there's more to the identity of this film than just nostalgia like those films, kind of. Sure, yeah. Um, There's like, there's just a lot that makes me just want to, like, be in with this culture, you know, it like really portrays Italy very well. Um, You get like a lot of, they're speaking like Italian all the time and they're doing all these like Italian things, riding bikes through Italy. It's so like nice to see. Um, And that's why it's like kind of of a relaxed movie as well. it's not like I don't want to say it's like plot heavy, but it is obviously has a plot. Um, yeah, but it's more just it's quite relaxing. Yeah, there's not really much of a story to it at all. It's more about the characters and them coming together and interacting and stuff. Um, and yeah, rewatching it yesterday, I was just so engrossed in everything that was happening. Uh, there was like never a point where I got bored at all. I was just so into everything and. I've seen it before and I don't, I did love it a lot then, but I don't know if I was quite as encapsulated into it as I was rewatching it. There's just something about it where I was just like, I, I really want to be there and soak up all of this myself. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I love Italy. I've been a couple of times. It made me want to go again. Um, I just love the country. Um, there's not a place that I've been to in Italy where it's like, you feel like out of place or like this doesn't really fit in like Italy. It's just like, this is, it's all got its own kind of Italian feel to it. So I can, 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 I kind of think you can set it like anywhere in Italy and it would feel like more or less the same. Um, but obviously then you set it in like the North to get like, um, like, like the snow at the end as well, where it would ra- uh, snow or like it would rain a bit. Um, also like on the coast as well, they've got like, dragging up like these statues and sculptures that feature heavily in the movie like in the um the intro with um just like the credits they go over yeah. like these pictures of the statues great song as well plays over that um and the music's amazing yeah yeah i've got the intro noted down as well like there's just loads of like pictures of sculptures there's this piano s- score and like all the like text looks like it's been like scribbled with chalk it just yeah it's quite a classy opening and i think it like just perfectly sets the mood for the film it's a great opening credit sequence yeah it's great might be one of my favorites uh from a movie honestly yeah um, i think i'd agree to be fair because it sets the scene it really does you get like these uh statues and the sculptures they dragging up from the uh the ocean they're studying them the dad's like uh like really steeped in this culture and he's trying to like figure out uh like how the sculptures were made or something or like just like studying them um he talks about like uh praxiteles of athens who was like the most uh renowned of the attica sculptors in like um the fourth century bc and he was like the first to sculpt the nude female form in a life-size statue so you get a lot from like these relics of an ancient past, and of course, in those days, like in like ancient Rome, like sexual sexual orientation really meant nothing, and like it's it's it is mirrored in the way that Oliver and Elio are like falling in love in this time as well, because it it doesn't mean anything. It's just like the the fact that they're of the same sex. It sort of doesn't mean anything in the context of this setting, where they can just fall in love and they don't really have to worry about repercussions. Yeah, and you can tell that um, Elio's father, played by Michael Stolberg, who is incredible in the film, you can tell that he um, is kind of jealous of them for having such a close relationship in that way. Like, there's an incredible monologue towards the end um, where he's just talking about how lucky they were to find each other, and just the writing of that scene and the performances is just so beautiful. Like I feel like that's the sort of scene that a lesser film could do and it would feel incredibly pandering and it would just like needlessly hammer in the themes of the film, but it just works so well here. Yeah, he was fantastic. He was phenomenal. That, that, um, 
I think that made me cry on like the first time I watched it. Uh, his speech. It's so like beautiful. He's like talking about how like it's something completely special. You get the feeling that like are we he he had that kind of thing when he was younger, but he couldn't act on it. Uh, so he, yeah, like he's kind of been forced into like the way he lives now. Like maybe like sure he loves uh, Elio's mother, but it's like if things had gone a different way, maybe he would have tried to do something akin to what Elio and Oliver did. He's talking about like how you gotta feel like your pain. Uh, he says to make you feel self feel nothing so as not to feel anything what a waste he says don't kill the sorrow pain and with that the joy you felt it's just a fantastic it's fantastic writing and it's just a great performance as well i don't think it cut either no i might have cut but it was like just this like a lot of just long takes of him saying yeah. these uh, this these monologues it's fantastic it's so good I um, generally love the parents the parents in this film, Elio's parents. They're just, I feel like a lot of films probably would have made the parents like super unsupportive and like homophobic and they would have like kept, done anything to keep them apart and also keep Elio from experiencing like these formative sexual relationships at such a young age. But the fact that they're incredibly understanding and they kind of help him in a way, like experience this and like constantly like, talking to him about it and never like treating him as like a child and talking to him like an actual adult i think that stuff is just generally really sweet and well written yeah he's not really treated as like i mean he's 17 in the movie uh the character he's not really treated like he's like a kid no like a teenager he's treated more like maturely i think he can understand a lot of like the mature themes that are going on um this is not a movie for like kids, but it's like you you understand the like the age barrier there. Like maybe I in a like different kind of movie, you could have, you could probably have like a problem with like the age barrier between Elio and Oliver because like Elio is seventeen, Oliver I don't know if they say his age. He looks like he's in his like late twenties or something. Um, yeah, or early I 30s. think in um in the original book, um, Elio was fourteen and Oliver was twenty three or something. Um, yeah. And so when you this, say it like that, it's like, mm. <laughs> yeah, I think even still a lot of people kicked off about it and said it was just basically just a film about a kid being nonced, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the problem you should have with this movie. The problem you no. should have with this movie is that army cannibal, army, fuck, I said it wrong. Army, <laughs> army hammer is a cannibal. That's what he is. <laughs> um, army cannibal. Jesus Christ. <laughs> No, that's the problem you should have with this movie is that every time uh, Army Hammer looks at like anyone, he's thinking of tearing the flesh off of their bones. <laughs> that's that's what you should think about. Like that's all I had going through my head. I didn't yeah. like realize that he he was like a cannibal before. <laughs> I don't even like know if I should call him a cannibal. <laughs> but that is, that's what he wants, isn't it? Like you read all these things about him. He, yeah, he's done some weird shit. Yeah, I mean, currently he's under investigation for raping his ex-girlfriend, so yeah, he's just kind of a bit of a scumbag. Um, I was worried re-watching the film that I'd spend the whole film just thinking, oh, Army Hammer definitely wants to eat Timothy Chalamet <laughs> right now. But I think after yeah. like after a little bit of thinking that, I just kind of forgot about that and just got so invested in the film that I yeah, kind of forgot about it. Yeah. They really like melt into like the characters themselves, and like just the the movie feels very of its own. It feels very well realized. So I never really, I never really got that. Like, yeah. Oh, he's gonna like eat his flesh. <laughs> There's like a point where like uh, Oliver's giving Elio a foot massage or something, and then like he like kisses his foot and then it cuts like immediately after that and I was like they probably had to pull him off <laughs> like smell the taste <laughs> of flesh <laughs> you had to pull him off um, the acting all throughout is fantastic from everyone Army Hammer is so good Timothy Chalamet is probably my favourite in the film I think mm -hmm. he's incredible in this film he does such a great job of getting across this like conflicted character um, he's like conflicted about his own sexuality and doesn't really understand it that well, um, but at the same time has this like great childlike innocence and energy throughout. I think he manages to express all these like 
deep emotion in things like in such a subtle way but it feels like almost effortless and i just think he's he's just a great actor especially in this yeah he's fantastic i think he learned a uh, piano for the part and it's yeah. as well just like you get that dedication from i was just like yeah maybe you could just speak italian beforehand maybe you just play piano beforehand but to like learn it for a part is something else entirely i think um you get like like with whiplash miles teller used like he he knew drums a bit beforehand uh but with this it's like to, to do something that's completely out of your element that's amazing to me i think he really does does the part justice and i do love yeah. him. he's a he's a great actor honestly i get a lot from his performance he really sells like the innocence and the um just like like he feels like someone who's who's come to this place all his life in the summers yeah he's he's great there's also um obviously the scene right at the end with him um crying by the fireplace and he that bit especially is really good like he's just sat yeah. there just like crying but like not like bursting out into tears just like he's just got tears running down his face he's trying not to be too loud because obviously his parents are in the room I think that scene especially is just so good. Yeah, God. Forget about him crying. I was crying then. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Oh, no. Don't do this to me. That scene is literally one of the most like heartbreaking and emotional endings to any film. And I, yeah. I, I love the way he's just like, it's just a one shot of him crying. You've got um, the Sufjan Stephen song, Visions of Gideon, playing and the credits are rolling next to him. I just think all of it's just really emotional and really great. Yeah, it's a fantastic, fantastic scene. Apparently he had like an earpiece playing the song as well, so like he knew all the timing and could like possibly properly understand and like convey the emotions. I think it works really well. It's a fantastic song. I was listening to it today as well, uh, just while I was on my walk. It's a brilliant song. A lot of great Sufjan Stevens songs in this uh, in this film as well, um, yeah. And that's like it was like super heartbreaking because it's like maybe before that you'd be like, "Oh, it's all right," because like next summer they'll just meet again or something, or like when when he's a bit older he can uh, see Oliver again. But it's like no, Oliver's getting married, so it's like yeah. it's never going to happen. Can't happen. Yeah, the music throughout is fantastic. Um, obviously we're talking about Sufjan Stevens songs. They're all great um got the song futile devices which is a great song from one of his earlier albums and he wrote mystery of love and visions of gideon for the film and like just all of the songs in the film are like some of my favorite songs of all time i was a big fan of him before watching the film but i like intentionally didn't listen to any of the songs he wrote for it because i was like i feel like it will work best in the context of the film And I think first time when um, Mystery of Love started playing, I just broke down because it was just Mm. such a beautiful song and it just really fit the scene super well. Um, It's fantastic, yeah. All these things that come together in this movie, it's like it shouldn't exist. It's like barely a movie to me. It's like just, it feels like a piece of history, honestly. It feels like you're looking into something that you shouldn't be seeing, but it's it's here and it's brilliant. And it's done by just this fantastic director. I think Luca Guadagnino is just a fantastic director. He did this, this like really lovely, nice romance movie. And then like the next year he did like Suspiria, the remake. And that's yeah. like like one of the most disturbing films I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's completely different. To be fair, that film's like completely different from his whole filmography from what I've looked up. It seems like all his films before that were kind of more like this. Like he's really sweet love films mm. a lot of the time set in Italy. Oh, he's fantastic. He could do anything. He could do literally anything. He's doing like that Scarface remake as well. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, he's also doing a sequel to this at some point. Based, I oh, don't, yeah, know if it's, yeah. don't know if it's going to be based on the book, because like, the writer wrote a follow-up book. I don't know if he's basing it off that or doing his own thing, because I'm pretty sure the book sequel was like pretty negatively received from a lot of people so don't know if they'll go in a different direction i don't yeah. know if they'll recast army hammer now <laughs> they can't surely he yeah he was the character um i don't i don't know if i would want a sequel really i don't know 
do you'd have to do something completely different or like i think of it like if you said it like like decades later and they met again but then it's like were you just like rehashing something like the before trilogy i don't know i think the book um it's like oliver doesn't show up till right at the end the majority of the book's all about elio's father it's set like 10 15 years later i think yeah i mean it could work who knows it's not like a film that really begs the sequel though is it no of course not i'd be interested to see it but if it doesn't happen i'm not gonna get upset about it no sure did you like the talking heads (laughs) t-shirt that elio wears i did i looked at that i was like chris is gonna love that (laughs) yeah yeah i fell in love with timothy chalamet in that scene yeah um great great costume designs i think yeah it's like summer clothes especially like when they're just like riding along in the like the cobbled streets of italy but italy looks amazing um just like the the kind of shots that they're able to get from like these different different places. There's like a shot where um they're at like this place and it's like a they're at like the war memorial type of type of thing. And then just before they like walk around the war memorial, which is like a very important scene, there's like a tree in the background and it's just like you no, know, it's just like flowing in the wind. And I'm like, Jesus, how do you get that shot to line up like that? There's a you got a tree there? What the hell? Yeah. There's a shot on location. How'd you find that tree there? Next to this war memorial that's so important to the to the movie, they're talking it like Elio's talking about like oh I don't know anything I just know like about like history and stuff I don't know anything about life and like that was a very important scene because like they circle around this memorial and by the time they get around to each other and and meet in the middle, like basically uh, Elio's like pronounced his feelings for Oliver. That was a fantastic scene. Yeah, definitely. You can um really tell even before that, that there's, like, this awkward chemistry between the two. And I think it Mm. really helped that they shot the film entirely, like, chronologically. So I think it it really helps because you can tell later on that their chemistry has grown. They've spent all this time together. You can really tell that they're closer than they were when the film started. I think that just really helps their chemistry and their relationship. Apparently, they were... they, they grew like very close to each other on the filming but i've got like a piece of trivia here it says uh the atmosphere shown in the movie is the exact same feeling they had about being in crema italy while in italy most people like to work for eight hours and then get the night off timothy and uh timote or should i say uh army uh spent their free time together having espressos going to dinner at restaurants hanging out at their hotel rooms watching movies and listening to music together and they became very close during these few weeks in Kremlin and are still very close to this day. So you, you do get you do get that. The the relationship between them is powerful. The chemistry is like just spot on. It's like the romance in this is like look at like stuff like oh I don't know. Like an Adam Sandler movie. You like <laughs> oh sure. <laughs> you, I hate to even compare it, but it's like the, the romance in this is just so immaculately well done. It's amazing. Yeah, this is one of the best um romances i've ever seen in a film and i think it just if the actors didn't have such incredible chemistry and didn't clearly connect in a lot of ways then i don't think it would have been anywhere near as good no reminds me of like a movie that came out a couple of years afterwards a portrait of a lady on fire which is also about like a same-sex couple falling in love in like a time when it was very difficult to be in love with someone who uh was the same sex as you so I, I couldn't help but like, uh, compare it to that. That's also like a fantastic movie. Yeah, to be fair, tonally that film's quite similar in how it's like fairly slow, but it's just very mm. beautiful. Uses a lot of the scenery to its advantage as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if you know that we, they only had like one rehearsal for this. It was like a really funny yeah. story I found. It was like um, uh, multiple interviews to Mate Charlemagne. And Armie Hammer said the director, Luca Guadagnino, asked them one day to come outside to do, a rehears- to do a rehearsal in the backyard of the villa. And they walked into a patch of grass and flipped their scripts to a randomly selected scene to practice. And when they opened the script, the page only read, Elio and Oliver roll around in the grass making out. And uh, Charlemagne and Hammer looked at each other and said, all right, let's go. And then uh, 
Apparently just seconds into the making out scene, however, Guadagnino stepped in and directed them to act more passionately. <laughs> so they started making out and uh, continued to do so, and no one told them to stop. And then Hammer <laughs> said that uh, crew members had just, just had to pull them apart before the actors stopped. Before, And then they like looked around and realised uh, Luca was... He just walked away, leaving the rolling around in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Apparently, um, Army Hammer said that like he felt completely comfortable in all the sex scenes, but he felt super uncomfortable at any scene he had to dance. Yeah, <laughs> there, were, there were quite a lot of those. To be honest, yeah. there were like a, like the disco place outside, or like at the end when they're on their little holiday. I really love that as well when they just like take their own holiday together. They go to like these uh like a waterfall. Like they're running around like these uh, streets, and they find like this these people having like a party in a car. <laughs> that was great. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, there's um quite a, I guess kind of an infamous scene now. Um, oh yeah, the peach scene where um Elio masturbates into a peach, puts it on mm-hmm. his desk, goes for a nap, and then Oliver comes in and basically just eats the peach and like licks to come out of it. And I remember the first yeah. time I watched it, I was like, this is gross. <laughs> and it was like the only thing I didn't like about the film. But this time I realized it's actually quite powerful in a way. Like Oliver shows Elio such like affection that clearly Elio has never like really felt and it brings him to tears. It's just really beautiful. Yeah. I don't really have a problem with that scene, honestly, because I think it, it works so well uh, in the context of the movie. There's yeah, like, I think it does. I do- I noticed this time around, there's like a lot of like build up to that in a way, like not like that in its in and of itself, but there's just like a lot of like scenes with like peaches and like peach trees and people eating peaches. It's like yeah, next step up, <laughs> fuck a peach. <laughs> yeah, and it's like weird um, and like disgusting as it is, like the cracking and squelching of the peach is like it still works. I yeah. still like it. <laughs> you know, apparently, way. um. Timothy Chalamet, he was like kind of hesitant about it. So um, Luca basically told him that he'd tried doing it himself and it works. So he was like, <laughs> okay, that's fine. And apparently um, Timothy Chalamet tried it himself afterwards and he was like, yeah, it does work. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but yeah, there was using a peach as a flashlight. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's something else. For a film as well. I don't know. People don't really like it. But I don't I don't mind it. It works. And then like yeah. Oliver tries to like suck him off and he's like, Oh, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Curly taste of like a peach. <laughs> <laughs> um apparently like the original screenplay and also the novel it's based on was like had much more explicit sex scenes. Um obviously mm-hmm. Timothy and Army had in their contract saying that they weren't going to do any full frontal nudity, um, which I know the screenwriter had a big issue with because he was like, it's unfair that we got like a woman who gets naked in it, we don't have a guy getting naked. Um, but I think in the end, Luca Guadagnino, he cut loads of like scenes from the film because he thought that he wanted the film to be more organic and he didn't want any like sex scenes. They didn't add anything to the film because he didn't want the film to be gratuitous in any way. And I think that definitely works. I definitely agree if there was much more sex scenes, it probably would have been completely unnecessary. There's basically only like one, isn't there? There's just this like long like scene where they're just like together in bed after, after like, in like the morning or the or at night. Yeah, you, you, there's like moments after and there's like, like a bit where you see um Oliver suck Elio off mm-hmm. and of course there's a bit where Elio sleeps with a girl and that's about it yeah it's very it's it's not like grotesque in any way it's not like pornographic at all it needs to be there to tell the story um and if 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 if, if like the the book was like really graphic like fine, it's a book, you know. You don't see it; it's a, it's words on a page. But um, to to think about like showing it on film, is something I feel is a bit different. But I'm glad that they didn't go that route because it could, it maybe it could feel a bit like gratuitous. Yeah, definitely. it's not. It's not that. It's not. It's not a gratuitous movie. It's just a romance, really. A nice, sweet, 
romance and that would have like detracted from like how like nice and sweet it was. Yeah. Apparently there was multiple points where um Army Hammer had wardrobe malfunctions from the shorts he was wearing and they oh, had to yeah. digitally edit some of his testicles out the shot. <laughs> yeah, I read that. Jesus yeah. Christ. Imagine being the poor person who has to digitally remove that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. The editing was like great. You you yeah. seldom notice like editing in in a movie. But this was just fantastic. It would like cut before like a sound finish. Like you think like they're gonna do more in a scene, but it would just cut to another scene. And then you realise, yeah, maybe we didn't actually need more from that scene. It it cut when it when it should have cut. But yeah, the editing just fantastic. I think just everything about this film is fantastic. There's nothing yeah. I dislike about the film. It just flows so well everything just comes together to create something i feel like it's just pretty much just perfect yeah it's, it's fantastic and the part where um elio is like talking to his dad and oliver he was like very open with with them he's like oh yeah me and marty are uh we almost had sex last night I'm like what you said you saying that to your dad yeah what the hell <laughs> couldn't dream of saying these things to my parents what the hell there's like a part where um he asks his father if uh his mother like knew about him and Oliver, and then his dad's like, "No, I don't think so." I was like, "Really?" Like, I feel like I I got a lot from like her performance. She was a really good actor. Um, like her performance was great, and I feel like we got like a lot of like moments with her, like how she would carry herself or how she would like look at Elio, and I just thought, she's like she knows. I feel like yeah. she knows. I felt like that, especially when she like suggests the idea of them going on this trip together. I definitely yeah. felt at that point, oh yeah, she definitely knows and wants them to have time together. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, oh, well, my son has met this uh, strapping young man in the most romantic country in the world, and yeah. now they're going to go on holiday together. But well, they're just good friends. They're just bros. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I've gone through all my notes. Don't know how much you have left. Um, I just, I would say that I liked it. I liked it a lot. I think it's a fantastic movie. Um, I like the, like the themes of like prejudice and how like maybe they they try to hide certain aspects of themselves to to the world. I like that they're also Jewish, so that kind of adds another layer to it. Yeah. Um, there's like a part where like Elio starts wearing his Star of David because like he sees um Oliver wearing his. He's like, oh yeah, um. Uh, my mum says we're uh, Jews of discretion. I'm like, and then like he's he basically like, that's like a coming out <laughs> in and of itself in a way. It's like he's able to like present himself fully to like the world in a way. So I just I love the the performances. The direction is fantastic. The music one of the best. I don't know if it was like a score that they did or just like songs that they compiled together, or like people wrote like different songs for the movie. That felt more like what it was. Um, it was just, yeah, it's perfect. It's a perfect freaking movie. Like, yeah. I'm not surprised it's like so well revered. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Should we get into ratings? Oh, yes. We'll do this one out of peaches, of course. Yeah. What else could it be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a beautiful, beautiful movie. Of course, the ending is very heartbreaking as well. So. If you're going to watch it, be prepared to cry a lot at the end, I guess. But it's just an incredible experience from beginning to end. It's one of the best romances in any film. Everything about it is just so perfectly done. Um, Yeah, I just love this film so much. And I'm, of course, going to give it 10 peaches out of 10. It's one of my favourite films from the last decade. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. I was surprised just how high it ranked for me. This is like genuinely one of my favourite movies ever made. Yeah. Um, and it helps that it's set in Italy. I love movies set in Italy. Um, this is one of the best out there, honestly. Um, watch it if you haven't. Honestly, it is that good. I'm going to give it 10 peaches out of 10. Nice. Very nice. So, with that, only two movies this uh, episode, but not to fear. we got three movies coming next episode.
Yeah. We got a we got a lot of conversation out of those movies, I think. Yeah, I thought about um talking about Godzilla versus Kong at the beginning, but I realized thinking about it earlier I actually remember almost nothing in the film, so <laughs> it was pretty yeah. good. That was nice. that was my review. Yeah. I would have talked about like Thunder Force. <laughs> but I couldn't be bothered to watch that movie. Yeah. Or like Chaos Walking. They want me to pay like sixteen pounds to rent Chaos Walking. Yeah. I'm not gonna that. do that. <laughs> No way. Should we get on to the recommendations? Yeah, sure. Um, do we want to do the guest recommendation now or say that at the end? Uh, do it at the end? Yeah, do it at the end. Um, so we've got a guest next week. My good friend Kai, co-host of a podcast I did like a year ago um, that we don't do anymore. And I thought about picking something really mean, like just really meme just to <laughs> really upset everyone. Um, but yep. in the end, I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll be kind and I'm going to pick a film that's in his like top three. And it's an incredible mm-hmm. movie. My pick is the 1974 film, A Woman Under the Influence, directed by John Cassavetes. It's on YouTube, so you can watch it on there for free. Nice. But we need to watch that. Uh, yeah. glad that we can delve into that. My recommendation, I wanted to go for something weird for Kai, and also for you, Chris, because I don't think you've seen this movie. It's not, like, super accessible, honestly. It's only available on, like, YouTube. I've not seen it uh, on a physical copy anyway, you can't get it. But it is... It's a good movie. But I'm I'm excited to see what you guys think about it cuz I don't know I don't know if it would like appeal to everyone. Um it's a Japanese movie directed by Masaki Iwana from 2007 and it is called The Million Souls. Nice. I've never heard of it so it should be interesting. Mm-hmm. Um should we go Kai's Kai's recommendation? Yeah. So Kai has picked a film that's on Amazon Prime, so I'll send you my account details so you can log into that, Max. Um, nice. It's a film called Homicide, directed by David Mamet from 1991. Hmm. This is another film that I'd never heard of before Kai recommended it, so I'm looking forward to watching it. Nice. Awesome. S- SMM 28, the Kai episode. Yeah. Tune in. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, we've got I feel like I have to like reiterate this as we as we go forward for, for the Sunday Movie Marathon episode thirty five. We got a show to watch for that one. It's getting closer and closer with every week. Westworld season one. Make sure to watch that for that one. Um, and of course we have our social media accounts. We got YouTube, the Sunday Movie Marathon, Twitter at Sunday Movie Pod, Facebook at Sunday Movie Marathon, and Letterboxed. At Sunday MM. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening. This has been episode 27 of the Sunday Movie Marathon. Skadoosh. Farewell. Doofenshmirtz Stable Incorporated. After hours. (sighs) Finally. A good night's sleep.